And then my daughter Anna, she just turned 16 years old. And then Glory, she's going to be turning, oh, what is that, 14, June 2nd. And then Wesley, he's 17 years old, be 18 in October. And uh, the song that we want to sing for you before we give a short update, uh, what the Lord's done is God is so good. And it's going to be a little bit different, so catch the words. We're going to sing it in English here, God is so good. But then, uh, because we're on a campus that has 35 different languages, and uh, in our classroom, we have eight students, and each one of them have a different heart language. And so what we ask them to do is translate God is so good into their heart language. And so we have, I think, five of them. We have four or five, six, seven. I think we got five, five languages that we're going to do outside of English. So I hope that you'll enjoy it. And uh, when you are hearing these words, uh, be thinking, hey, God is so good. Aren't you glad he is? Amen. All right. So here we go. Where do you want me to stand? Right here in the middle? That, that pick me up. <laughs> are you guys ready? And I'll try to uh, tell you what the song is, or what the title of their language is as we go. So we'll start out with English. Ready? Here we go. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Tongue Well, the Bible teaches us, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And we just have a few bullets, a few things that we'd like to share with you about how the Lord's been working in our lives while we've been over in India. We've had an institute, your pastor just said, that we are partnered with South India Baptist Bible College and Seminary. And just in a few weeks, um, Brother Cherry and Dr. Cherry will be in the services here. And he's kind of the overseer of the campus. And each year, there's about 400 students that pile into this ministry, and they are training to be pastors, missionaries, evangelists, pastors' wives, uh, children's ministries. They really are uh, putting out in India an army for the Lord, and it's exciting. There are over a 1,000 graduates that are in ministry now over the last, well, since 1985 when the school has started. And it is our privilege as Worldview Ministry and now Worldview Institute to be able to partner with a school like that because out of all of the languages that are represented that still do not have the language, a third of them are right there in India. And there's 1.2 billion people in that country. They serve over 30 million gods. I can't even think about that. So it is a very dark country and they need the gospel. And they need the scriptures in their heart language. And so the Lord has allowed our institute to be established right there on that campus in southern India. And we have eight students. We have had the privilege. Uh, this is our fourth year of going back there in June. June 9th we leave to head back to India to, to start our next year. Uh, but we've had the opportunity to graduate uh, a class. And I just want to share two highlights one of the highlights is we had this young man by the name of Chung Tui. He left his family. He had three daughters and a wife. And he came down to study. He spent two years uh, with us learning how to be a Bible translator. His people had no scripture. 
and they were using Adoniram Judson's Bible that he was able to do in the Burmese language. And it is offensive for them to be called Burmese people. They are from Miramar, and they are of a tribe that they don't want to be associated with the Burmese. So when they were reading the Burmese language, it was almost like a prick every time they heard it. And they wanted something in their own heart language. So Chong Toy, he came into our class, and he was wondering what we were doing. And we told him about what the Institute was about, about translating the Word of God for people that didn't have it. And so Chong Toy said, I want to be a part of that class. So he left his MDiv program and joined our class, and he spent two years. And the last year, our five that we had, and myself, we were able to go through the book of Mark and give him a rough translation of the word of God. And he took that to his people, and he went to the village officers, and he said to them, hey, listen, here is the rough translation of Mark. Would you sponsor me? Would you help me so that I can complete the whole New Testament? And they're on board. And he, he doesn't accept American money. He's doing it on his own. He's just in his village trying to get the word of God into their heart language. He started Matthew. And the day that he started Matthew, tragedy struck. And his daughter was uh, bitten probably by a snake. We're not for sure. And she died. And we thought that we were going to lose Chong Toy, but God reconfirmed in his heart that he must go on, and he has rededicated himself to the translation. He's finished the book of Matthew, he's done a revision of the book of Mark, and now God's burdened his heart that he just doesn't want to be a Bible translator, he wants to be an evangelist, and that he is going into places uh, where it's Muslim people, and he moved his family so that he can start a church there, and while he's doing this Bible translation, he has a burden and a heart for souls, so we're thankful for Chong Toy. And then a second story is a guy by the name of Bishwa. Bishwa is a young man. He and Hincha uh, were, they came to our class because they had a burden for a people group in Bhutan called the Layat people. They don't have a written language, let alone the scriptures. And no one is even thinking about going to this group of people called the Layat. And it, they were burdened by that. And so they began to pray. They formulated a sheet of paper and uh, talking about the need of getting to the Layat people. And so after the two years of us praying and, and God giving us direction, Hincha, his parents wanted him to come back to school to get more training. But Bishwa, he still had a firm belief that God was going to open a door for him to get into Bhutan. And so we began to pray, how could you get there? What steps can we take? See, as an American, our hands are tied. We can't get into Bhutan. It is very difficult, and we thought it might be easier for a national Indian to get into Bhutan. It's just as hard. And so we talked with Justin Levine. You know him. He's a missionary to Nepal, and I believe you guys support him as well. And Justin, as he's working with the Tibetan people, he came down to do one of our classes, and we began to talk with him about Bishwa joining him for a year to do an internship. Justin was all for it. He says, does Bishwa know Hindi? And Bishwa's like, yeah, I know Hindi. And he says, this is going to be great. There are Bhutanese people in my class. And this is going to be great. There's all kinds of refugees in the city of Kathmandu. Come. So Bishwa went with the hopes of meeting some Bhutanese people that he might be able to get a door into the country of Bhutan. Well, this is exciting. Because he went through our training, we have a strict emphasis on English. We teach English grammar, English format writing, conversational English. I mean, every year that we have it, we're pumping English in them. And Bishwa took that, and he went to a school there in Nepal, and he said, I'm trained to teach English. Would you hire me? And the, the teacher and the administration of one school says, we are all full, but go next door. They are looking for teachers. So he went with the credentials that he was given. He introduced himself. He said, I've taught English. I've been trained in English. I want to teach English. They hired him on the spot. And they said, listen, when can you start? And he was like, well, I, I can start in a day or two. Can you start today? 
Well, it gets better. Because as he was there in the ministry or in that school teaching English, they liked what he was doing. But you and I know what it's like when the Buckeyes are about ready to win the national championship. We can't keep it quiet. We are excited everywhere we go. We are talking about that just a couple of years, 2016. The Chicago Cubs were going to win the World Series. I know there's some Cleveland fans here. I am so sorry. But my son and I were in India, and we could not keep it quiet about the Chicago Cubs and their opportunity to win. Well, my point is this, is that when you have a burden, when you have something on your heart, you share it, right? Well, Bushwa was doing just that. He was sharing his burden, and it got to the administration. And the administration had come to Bishwa and said, hey, listen, we just want you to know that our facility... Our administration just purchased in Bhutan a satellite school, and we need English teachers. Would you consider going and being one of our teachers there? Would I? He's all excited about what God is doing, and that's it. It's God's work. God wants the layout people to be reached with the gospel, and he's laid it on the heart of this young man, Uh, Bishwa to be able to do that. So I just wanted to share that story with you because it just, it gets me all excited because God is working in and through the lives of our young people. Um, We have eight students this year. We've, we've already went through one year and our, our ministry does three things. We teach Bible principles and procedures. How, what, what do we do? How do we do Bible translation? We want to make sure that when they translate the word of God, it is authentic. It is authoritative. They can say when it's put into their heart language, thus saith the Lord. Amen. And I'm so glad that we can do that in our English language. And so we want to take the principles and the procedures that the people that have gone before us and who've done it right and put it into their hands. But we want to do it in the original languages also. We don't want them to translate from the English. We don't want them to translate from the the, the French or the German. We want to translate from the language that God gave. And the reason is because you and I can improve upon that which God has done. We can improve on creation. It's already been done quite well, would you say? Well, he gave his word in the Hebrew and the Greek language and the Aramaic, and we can't improve that. So we need to go back and to be able to take them through those languages so that they are able to give an accurate rendition of the word of God into their own language as it goes from the source to the target language. And then finally, we want to give them the opportunity to understand linguistic principles. So those are the three prongs that we, uh, we teach there in India. We teach the Bible principles and procedures, the original language, and then the linguistic program. This past year, these eight students went through the biblical language, and they went through the Bible procedures and principles. This year is the toughie. They get to go through all of the linguistic principles to help them take apart the Greek language and put it back together to where they understand it and then go to a language that hasn't been written before and they are able to have the tools to give them an alphabet and to give them the word of God into their heart language. So we're thrilled about what God's doing and we change the curriculum in such a way that we can add students every year. So this year we have eight students that will be doing their second year, their linguistic track, And now we have a total of nine that will be joining us. So we'll have 17 students this year. And we're just excited about what God's doing uh, in and through our lives and in the ministry of Worldview Institute. Wow, isn't that great? I I can't, I I remember the first time I sat with uh, Brother Levine and Brother Cleghorn, and you might have been in that. Uh, they were talking on the bus, and I was thinking, how do you begin to even, when, a, when a, somebody doesn't even have a written language, how do you begin, where do you start? What do you mean you got to get an alphabet? You know what I mean? And then I learned some things. There's an international 
<clears throat> alphabet or something. They pick, you know, the sound. It's 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 an incredible uh, thing, and uh, it's it's amazing what God's doing there. That's a great great work, and this is the this is the place we go when I've been to India a couple times with Brother Fielder. It's at South India Baptist Bible College, and uh, I've got to meet some of the students that uh, the names are very familiar to me, and uh, it's great great work that God's allowing them to do there. Amen. All right, take, take a songbook. We're going to sing again together. Uh, let's just go to 275. Well, we, let's sing it as well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way. It's 275. Go ahead and stand together, and Brother Jamie will lead us on this. And we'll do uh, the first verse, third verse, then we shake hands for a little bit and come back and do the last. All right? When peace like a river. Shake hands with a friend. on that last verse as you go back to your seat many of you know it here we go and the Lord haste the day when my face shall be sighed the clouds be rolled back as 
as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so. Be seated, if you will. Ushers will come and we'll get our offering tonight. If you need an envelope you want to give to the Overtons, uh, you want to put an envelope, just put your hand up and Brother Moreland will get an envelope to you right away. Anybody needs one, just put your hand up. If you put anything on your envelope you want to give to them, uh, designate it, uh, put Overton on it, and uh, we'll make sure they get that, okay? Anybody need that, we'll make sure we give that to them tonight. All right, let's pray and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering tonight. Brother Andy, you lead us in prayer, please. Father, it's good to be in your house tonight. And so good, so good to know and have the confidence that no matter what happens, what our circumstances are, it is well with my soul. And because I have you and I have your son, Jesus Christ, in my heart, I thank you so much for that. Lord, we just pray that you bless this offering now and uh, open our hearts for the preaching of your word. And Father, may what all that's said and done be pleasing in your sight. And we'll thank you and give you the praise for it, for you are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're looking forward to uh, having Brother Overton preach for us tonight. And uh, again, <clears throat> we're, we're honored to partner with them in the ministry that they're doing there. And uh, it's a, I wish sometime you could all go over there and see it. Uh, it's just an amazing thing. And they do a great job there at the college. And uh, they have uh, just, just done a great job, not only with the institute, but just with the college itself. And uh, they have done a lot of con contributions to the music ministry. I think they've added some drama uh, into it as well. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great thing to behold. And uh, we're glad they got to squeeze us in while they're home. Uh, just two months is not a very long time to uh, get around to everybody you'd like to get around to, uh, but we're glad that uh, you were able to come and be with us. We're honored for that. We're going to have, I think they're going to sing, and then Brother James is going to preach for us tonight. All right, you come. Before we sing, um, many times when we're in India, uh, it is the prayers uh, uh, that you guys give up to the Lord on behalf of missionaries like us that really get us through um, because we, li we live in a dark land and uh, they're not friendly towards Christianity and uh, we just are thankful that we know that there is someone holding the ropes um, back here in the States and we just want to say thank you for that. And the song we're about to sing is called When God is Silent and I hope that it'll be a blessing to you. 
That sounds good. If you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. And I have this on, so uh, that's great. Acts chapter number 20. One of the things about our ministry is that we believe that the Scriptures are vital. And I hope that as in a church like this, you understand as well that the Word of God is vital to every issue every situation of of life you need the scriptures why because it is the revelation of God to us it is a way it is the way that the Lord has given to us so that we might know him and the Apostle Paul he emphasized the scriptures in the life of everyone that he came into contact with he pointed people to the Word of God. And tonight, we just want to briefly look at how he did this very thing in the heart and lives of the Ephesian pastors. We're going to see in Acts chapter number 20 that when the Apostle Paul was leaving to go to Jerusalem and he was going to say his goodbyes to these men, um, they gathered together off, of, off the coast uh, of, of Ephesus just south of Miletus or right there in Miletus and look with me at Acts chapter 20 and let me find it here and look with me at verse number 32 
verse number 32, is basically Paul's final words that he leaves with these Ephesian pastors. They would see him no more. And this is what he says. He says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how He said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and he prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him into the ship. Well, the very last words that he gives to these, uh, these pastors, these men that he had trained and had left to minister, is that he commended them to God and he commended them to the word of his grace. Or the, it says here, to the word of his grace. And he's talking about the words of God. He, he, he gave them to God and to the very words of Scripture. And he didn't just stop there. There was a young man by the name of Timothy. And there was another young man named Titus that were very close to the Apostle Paul. And he sent Timothy to the churches of Ephesus. And later, Timothy became the pastor of Ephesus. And we find that we go to 2 Timothy, and as the Apostle Paul is in Rome, he writes his final letter to Timothy, and he emphasizes once again to these pastors and to Timothy the need to stay glued to the Scriptures, to to heed the words of God, to let the words of God impact their life because it is the very foundation of our faith and practice. It is that which gives us life and life abundant. And so stay close to the Scriptures, Timothy. So we want to take a moment and we're going to go to 2 Timothy and we're going to look at just a couple passages that Paul emphasizes the Scriptures to Timothy, ultimately to these pastors at Ephesus and how they can impact our lives today. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing. Lord Jesus, we love You and thank You for this evening. And Lord, the songs that we've sung have been encouraging. And Lord, my soul has been lifted. And it has been refreshed by being here already tonight. And I pray that as we look to the Word of God tonight, that our hearts would continue to be refreshed and encouraged in the things that we already know and have been encouraged with. But Lord, we just ask that you would continue to to work in our hearts. Lord, we don't want to be the same. Lord, we want to be changed. Um, by the Word of God and our applying it in our lives every day. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So take your Bible, turn with me to 2 Timothy. Because here we find the extension of Paul's commending them to God and to His Word, the Word of His grace. He continues this idea of focusing in on the Scriptures. Look with me at chapter number 1 of 2 Timothy, and look with me at verse number 13. It says this, it says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So he looks at Timothy and he's writing, he's he's wanting to encourage this young man in the faith and he challenges him. He commands him to hold fast the form of sound words. Well, what are those sound words? The word sound is is a word that actually talks about being healthy. Having healthy words. Well, what are more healthier than the very words of God that give us life? And that sustains us and that encourages us and strengthens us. He says, hold those sound words, Timothy. Those words that you've heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ. And then look at verse number 14. It says, the good thing. You see, the sound words are good things. 
This is the, the words that are from our Heavenly Father. He says, those good things which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. So we find this idea of holding fast and keeping. The idea of one writer says this, the responsibility to preserve sound teaching from being corrupted is now in the hands of Timothy. He is to make sure that it is not corrupted through distortion or delusion or deletion and addition. He was to hold the truth with faith and love in Christ Jesus. He was to keep the Word of God. Now, i got to be honest here that the job has now been extended to you and to me. It is our responsibility to hold fast the words of God. Well, who are we to hold them fast for? Well, we need to hold them fast for ourselves. But we need to hold them fast for the next generation. You see, the Bible teaches us in Psalm 89 that the word of God is settled forever in heaven. Amen? And it is to every generation. Well, we know that the provision of God's words is in His hands. But He allows us, He has given us the responsibility to make sure that they get an accurate account of what He said. He uses the Holy Spirit in our life. He encourages us, He strengthens us as believers to make sure that we teach the next generation. If we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, it is the family's responsibility. It's not just pastor's responsibility. It's not the youth pastor's responsibility. No, it is parents' responsibility to make sure that the next generation can have the Word of God. That not only just to have it, but to know it. You know, one of the blessings about having a church is uh, the, the, the Wednesday night programs that we have. I don't know if you have a Wednesday night program here, Wana's or, or Master's Club or the Patch the Pirate Club. I don't know about you, but I get excited about those things. Because you know what those kids are getting? They're getting the Scripture. They're getting the Word of God. They're memorizing the Bible. They're letting the Word of God get down into their heart and they begin to meditate on that. What's happening is that the Word of God is being passed from one generation to the next generation. And we must continue that. It is our responsibility. Here Paul, he challenges Timothy, hold fast to sound doctrine, to that which is going to strengthen us, that's going to build us up for the glory of God. Notice he goes on to say this in chapter 2, verse number 2. The second thing that Paul begins to describe here is he says, and the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. So we find here that the Scriptures are being emphasized that you and I are to find somebody to invest our life into. Do you see that? Let's look at it again. And the things that thou hast heard of me. Paul is telling Timothy, look, you've learned some things from me. You spent some time with me. It has been said, that you know the Apostle Paul, he was under the tutelage of a man by the name of Gamilia or whatever, I can't really pronounce his name right, but that G-man, we call him that. And they said that in order to be uh, a, a scholar or a Pharisee of, of the type that the Apostle Paul was trying to be under, they would spend their life with those men. It wasn't just a nine to five thing. They would spend their life with these men who would train them. And if we look at the, the, the master disciple or the master teacher and what he did with the 12 disciples, they didn't go home on the weekends. They were with them 24 7. It took a lot of time, it took a lot of discipline, it took a lot of effort. And when those disciples said, that they would follow Jesus, they meant it. They left everything and followed the Lord for those three and a half years. 
And my point is, is that if we are going to build up the next generation of leaders and men and women that's going to uh, fill our pews, we have to disciple people. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou the faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is the great commission in action right here. Where you teach them about the gospel, they trust Jesus Christ as Savior, they are faithful, they want to learn, and you take them in and you begin to disciple them to the point that they are able to become your teachers. And they become your Sunday school teachers and your teachers of the Master's Club. So here is a great example to Timothy. The emphasis is the things that you've heard. Well, what did you hear, Timothy? Well, it was the Scriptures. It was the things that he had taught him that was going to make a difference. You see, the Gospel changes everything, doesn't it? Can you remember the time before you were saved and what your life was like? And the the way and the direction that your life was being headed? uh, the, The path that you were going down? And when God stepped in, when He moved in and He He touched your heart, we sing that song, It was on a Monday, somebody touched me. It was on a Monday. You guys remember that song? I'm not, I'm not singing blasphemy, I don't think. <laughs> but what happened is, is that God stepped in. Someone told you about the Scripture and how that you were lost and how that you needed to be saved. And the best you knew how, you prayed and said, Oh God, you're right! I am a sinner. I need to be saved. And you got saved that day. And your life hasn't been the same since. Now, i got to tell you, if you're in here and nothing's changed, then you need, to, you need to do some business with God. Because when I got saved, I got it all! I trusted Christ as a 12-year-old boy. And I didn't know what I was getting into, but I knew that what I heard was true. I knew that I was a sinner. When, when they opened the Bible and they started reading Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh-huh. That's me. Their mouth was like an open sepulcher. Deceit was found therein. You know, that was me. I was a liar. I was a thief. I was a man that was undone and unclean. But i got to tell you, When the Bible said that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, I agreed. Did you? But oh, when I heard that God commended His love toward me, and that while I was yet lost and in sin, a sinner, the Bible says, God stepped in. And He gave me a gift. And all I need to do is accept that gift. And that gift was Jesus Christ. See, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Boy, that gets me excited. And it's the same message that they need to hear in India. And they need to hear it in their heart language. And so there's an emphasis that is placed here by the Apostle Paul. The Scriptures is what men and women need to stand on. It's not my opinion as a pastor or a missionary. It is God's Word that's going to make the difference. God's Word, the Gospel, is powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Rightly dividing, and it can uh, change our life. So he says here, All the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses commit thou to younger men. So here's the challenge tonight. When it comes to this verse, is who is God going to lay on your heart? so that you might commit the things that you've heard. Well, I didn't go to Bible school. But have you heard some things? Well, well, you know, I'm not a pastor. Well, have you heard some things? Have you been in this church for about a year? Have you been in here two years? How about five years? How about ten years? Well, you've heard some things. I know this pastor. He doesn't just blow smoke up here. He preaches the Word of God. And you've heard some things. And now it's our responsibility to take that which we've heard and look out and see somebody that we can invest our life in. And that's what it is. It's an investment. 
It's not that you're sacrificing. You're investing something in someone's life that is powerful and it's going to change them for the glory of God. And you're going to be blessed because of it. So he goes on, now look at verse number 15. If we are going to commit to faithful men, here is the next emphasis that the Apostle Paul places in verse number 15 of the same chapter. He says, then you need to study. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I've got to be honest here. that I, I've, I just finished my MDiv, my Master of Divinity, in biblical languages. And I've got to tell you something. Don't, don't tell anybody. Is this, is this live? If it's, it's okay if it is. They won't watch it. They do? Oh, this is... All right, here it is. I preached heresy before and didn't know it. There were some things that I didn't know that the Word of God was saying. And I was saying it as if God said it. And I was miscommunicating what God was saying. Now, I've got to be... Frank, that God still used me. But you know what's a beautiful thing to know when you realize that and you humble yourself before the Lord and you say, oh God, will you help me to study your word? Lord, I don't want to stand in your pulpit and preach heresy. Lord, I want to be a channel to where you speak to my heart and I accurately understand it and then I can give it to your people so that they can understand it. I don't want to preach my three-point outline that sounds good. I want to preach what God said. Because it's what God says. And when I stand on what God says, that's what's going to change me. That's what's going to help me. And that's what's going to help the people there in India and what's going to help us here tonight. So he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. I, I like this word study. It's found uh, translated in different ways in our English Bible. It's translated forward to do, endeavoring to keep, diligence to come, and laboring to enter. So these are some words that this word study is found. So it has the idea of forward or endeavoring, diligence, labor. So I, I decided to say, all right, well, what does all that mean? So let me just bring it down to the cookie shelf to where we can all get a piece of the chocolate chips. Here's the idea. Is that Paul was telling Timothy to have a purposeful pursuit with the Word of God. Pursue the Word of God to where you understand it. Well, that's what I want in my life. Why? Look at verse 19. He, he's talking here and he says that there are some that are not going to hold to the truth of the Word of God. And he says in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal that the Lord knoweth them that are His, and, that, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, I just want to tell you this, is that Jesus gave a fantastic illustration about the house being built on the rock and the house being built on the sand. Well, that's what he's saying here about the foundation being sure. You see, there's 1.2 billion people in India. There's about uh, 1 to 2 million Christians there. And we're thankful for that. That's a lot of people. But what those 1.2 billion people are doing, whether they're Muslim or Hindu, is they are standing on a foundation that is unsure. They're stepping, they're putting and basing their life on principles that is faulty. I read just recently that if the ground you're standing on is not sure, what can you do? Well, you fall. That's what you do. You, you sink. There was a time when I was up in Mayo, Michigan. I like to hunt. And we were hunting grouse. And I love grouse. They call them partridges or pats. We call them grouse. And and we were up there, and we were on this place called Gabion's Landing. And it had rained the night before, and it's kind of like a swampy area anyway. It's by the Asabo River right there in Mayo. And I tell you, it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous in the fall. We get three days to go up there hunting. And so whether it's raining, snowing, we go out there and we labor in the rain, snow, doesn't matter. Heat even sometimes, and you know, shed off all the things, and we're out there with our little gun. I have a 16-gauge Browning, and I love it. It's fantastic. It's kind of short. It's fantastic. But 
it was soggy. And I thought I was walking on solid ground, and I, and I was stepping gingerly. And there was a place, and you know, when you're going grouse hunting, there's all these trees, and they're saplings, they're short, and they slap you in the face. And so you really just got to be careful. You get hurt out there. And so I'm, I'm looking down, and I began to take a step, and I think to myself, this is going to be good. This is solid. And it was kind of a little watery at the top. And I put my foot down, and it sunk all the way up to my knee. See, I thought that I was standing on something that was firm, but it wasn't. I looked over to my left, and I saw that there was a rock. And I thought, you know, I probably should have stepped on the rock. But, you know, I pulled out my foot, and my foot came out by itself. The shoe was still stuck way down yonder, and I'm like, oh, this is terrible. So I put my foot back in it because I didn't want my sock all wet, and I didn't want to be miserable all day. So I reached down, and I pulled out my boot with my foot, and I heard this sound of suction that came out of the ground. My point is this, is that when you and I put our faith and trust in the very words of God, you are stepping on the solid rock. You can build your life on the principles of God's Word and it is firm, it is something that will protect you, and you can have life abundant, as God said. But if you choose to have it your way, you know, there was a famous singer by the name of Frank Sinatra. He sung this song, I Did It My Way. If that's the way you live your life, and many of us did for so many years, you build your life on what you think is right, or what the Hindus have thought was right, or the Muslims that thought were right, or the Mormons, or whatever you want to say, that have gone astray from God's Word, and they built their life on that which is sinking sand. And their life is being destroyed, and they don't even see it. So tonight, the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, the foundation of God standeth sure. You can build your life on the Word of God and it will hold you. It will protect you. It will provide for you. God lieth not. In Titus it talks about how God lieth not. It actually could be translated the non-false God. So we find here that in Timothy, the Scriptures are being emphasized. Well, I have one last thought. So hold fast to the sound doctrine. Commit to faithful men. Study the Word of God. We should always be a learner. We should never stop learning. And then look at verse number 14 of chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14. And we'll look down to verse 17. These are very familiar verses. It says this, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. We could go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and, and understand that Lois and his grandmother were faithful at teaching young Timothy the Word of God. So that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are, get this, able to make thee wise unto salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we find here two major reasons why the emphasis is placed on the Scripture. Paul says, number one, that the Scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation. See, if you don't have the Word of God, if the people in India don't have the Scriptures, they can't put their faith in what God said. You see, it was Abraham, the, the righteousness was imputed unto Abraham because he heard what God had said and he believed it. He, he, he put it to work. Let, let me just say it. He stood on it. That's what he did. He, he, he heard the words of God, Go out from this land, and I will show thee a land that thou knowest not, and I will make thee a great nation. And he said, Okay, I'll do that. The best he knew how, he began to apply the Word of God. Now, I want to give you a piece of history, okay? About right around that 50-year mark, 
when he was called out to the earth of the Chaldeans, Noah could have possibly been alive at that time. But we know for sure that Ham, Sham, and Japheth was. Now I've got to tell you, where did he go? Where did Abraham go when he left the Ur of the Chaldeans? Could it have possibly been that when he left that city, he journeyed to a place where Sham was? And Noah probably had passed away maybe 50 years ago, maybe, maybe 25 years ago, but he sat down with Uncle Sham and he heard an eyewitness account of the flood. That's what I said when I read it. You got to be kidding. But this is what I'm saying is that Abraham, he just didn't believe fairy tales. He believed the very words of Almighty God. And you know, that's what we have tonight. We have the very words of God. And it is able to make us wise unto salvation. And notice again here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that we find in verse number 16 that all Scripture is given by who? By God. And what's His character like? What's His character like? He's perfect, isn't He? He's holy, isn't He? He doesn't make mistakes. And we have the Scriptures that were given by Him. And so therefore, when you and I build our life upon what God says, you're building your life on something that is authentic, it has authority, and it will. It won't hope to. It will change your life. That's why RU Ministries is having success. Because when people apply the Word of God to their life, they're going to be changed. But if you say, that's too hard, of course it's hard. If it was easy, everybody would be okay. But it's difficult. It's challenging. It's sacrificing. But i got to tell you, when you do it, when you do it God's way, you're going to be blessed. Because God said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Amen? Amen. i got to tell you tonight, the Scriptures are important. And Paul emphasized the Scriptures. And this is my final comment. Look at verse 17, would you? The Bible says this, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. i got to tell you something. What this is insinuating, what this is saying, is that there's imperfect people in here tonight. There's an imperfect missionary here tonight. And we need to come to the Scriptures so that we might be perfect. Well, what does that word perfect mean? It's actually the same word that Jesus used on the cross when He says it is finished. It's a word that we use called telos. And what, it, what it's saying is, is that it's completed. It's done. It's fulfilled. So what God is trying to say, He wants to take people who are incomplete and make them complete. Those who are not full to be filled. Those who are not perfect to be perfect. There's, there's, a, there's a word that is used in the Hebrew that we like to use. It's called shalom. Have you ever heard of that? We, we would say that word shalom is the word for peace. But i got to tell you, there's something more about that word than just peace, what it means is completeness. And there's a couple times, matter of fact, I think one time in Isaiah where it says shalom, shalom, peace, completeness, completeness. And where is that completeness found? Let me tell you, it is found in Jesus Christ. It is found in the Word of God. And when you and I humble ourselves, and when we say, okay, I'm going to let God dictate my life, and I'm going to let the Word of God impact my direction and guide me in my life, then I'm telling you, you're going to be complete. You're going to be able to say, shalom, shalom. You're going to be able to say in your heart, in your life, and in your family, amen. Can you say amen with me? You guys just spoke Hebrew. 
You know what that word means in Hebrew? Firm. Firm. Well, what are we going to stand on tonight? We're going to stand on the very Word of God because it changeth not. And it will change our life. So tonight, as we look to the Word, as we looked at these passages, the Apostle Paul was writing young Timothy to these Ephesian pastors, and he wanted them to know that it is the Scriptures that make the difference. It's going to make the difference in each of your life. Tonight, when you go home, you can turn on the TV. That's fine. You can turn on the music. That's fine. Whatever. But remember that it's the Scriptures, not the Simpsons, that's going to make the difference in your life. Listen, God bless you. Thank you so much for your time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. And we're thankful for the Word of God. And Lord, there's so many people that still don't have it. And that's one of the main reasons why my wife and I are going. Because we believe that you've placed in our heart a burden to go. And Lord, we're so thankful for a church like this who sees the need to support a family like us. For these years that we've been partnered together, Lord, it, it, it's important that they hear the Scripture. That they get the Scripture. But Lord, it's important for them, but it's important for us as well. Lord, because we walk into a bookstore and we can see 35 different translations, we can take it lightly. But Lord, help us to remember tonight as You placed emphasis on the Word of God, Lord, help us to make it a priority in our life as well. That we study it. That we teach it. That we share it. to the, We give it to the next generation. We hold it fast, Lord, so that we might have that abundant life You promised. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.